What I wanted to do in this lecture was take all the things that we've learned about linear elastic mechanics and just show where plasticity plugs in. We're not going to talk about how yet, that's kind of the focus of the next section, but uh, this is kind of the bridge that's going to take us out of linear elastic mechanics and move us into the, our, our section on plasticity. So let me just remind you, uh, we've basically come up with um, uh, three expressions that represent 15 equations for 15 unknowns. So let me remind you what those are. The first was uh, the equations of motion, which we could write as sigma ij, comma j, plus rho bi is equal to rho ui double dot. So that's the equations of motion. And we talked about strain displacement relations, which were epsilon ij is equal to one half uh, ui comma j plus uj comma i. And finally, and, and I'll just note that these equations, these two, they were independent of any constitutive law. The only thing that we required in, in, of those is uh, that we did require small strain, uh, at least in order to represent the strain tensor like that. And then we talked about the elastic constitutive law, or what we called Hooke's law, for, or at least for linear elastic materials. And that looked like sigma ij is equal to lambda epsilon kk delta ij plus uh, 2 mu times epsilon ij. Okay, so that's our linear elastic constitutive law. Now I want to pose a question. You know, and, and, and I guess I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say it in a way that I think you already know the answer, even though we haven't talked about it. What about thermal strains? You know, you've, you've encountered those in the past in previous classes. How did you handle thermal strains? Well, hopefully you remember, and, and we'll, just, we'll just talk uh, real generally in 1D just because it's a little easier to think about. Hopefully you remember that we, we would write uh, that the total strain, epsilon, this is back in when it's not a, just 1D form, was equal to the elastic strain plus the thermal strain, epsilon T we'll call it. And we would just call epsilon t as the coefficient of thermal expansion alpha times the temperature difference delta t uh, from some reference. Of course, this uh, I will say that this representation implicitly assumes small strain. Anytime we can add strains like elastic plus a thermal, uh, we're talking about small strain. If we're talking about large strains, we have to uh, do a multiplicative decomposition uh, using the deformation gradient tensors. Uh, right now, we're not going to focus on that in this class. So let me ask a different question. Does uh, the thermal strain, does epsilon t, does it contribute to the stress? And I hope that you're going to tell me that no, it doesn't. And how do we know that? Uh, so let me just say that the answer is definitively no. Um, and I just will say that, that there's a caveat. This is provided um, that uh, that expansion or contraction is allowed. All right. So, you know, if we're if we're putting something, let's say, into a crack and we allow it to expand, obviously it can it can break the material because there are stresses that are induced as the thing expands, but that's because we put artificial or displacement constraints on there. If we just allow um, a piece of metal, for example, to expand under or contract due to temperature change, um, we don't think of stresses building up in that material. We just would say that the strains uh, build up because or, or change because of the temperature change. And so we would write the stress uh, as stress is equal to, this is still in 1D, Young's modulus times whatever the total strain is minus that term alpha delta T, or we would write that as um, Young's modulus times epsilon minus epsilon T, and this quantity we would call the elastic strain, and so we could similarly just write it as the elastic, uh, the elastic strain times Young's modulus. So how about in tensor form? So we kind of talk through it in 1D. In tensor form, we can write it as follows. It's essentially the same. Sigma ij is going to be equal to, 
And I'm just going to, I don't want to write out all of the Hooke's Law, so we'll just leave it as CIJKL, keep it general, uh, is equal to epsilon KL, the total strain, minus now epsilon KL, the thermal strain, right? Which we could also write as CIJKL times the total strain uh, minus alpha KL now. So um, our thermal expansion coefficient is now a tensor times delta T. If we wanted to write out what alpha looks like, we could write that alpha and typically when we do when we talk about thermal expansion we usually only talk about a normal thermal expansion so it looks like alpha 1 1 alpha 2 2 alpha 3 3 is is what that tensor would look like so that's a material property tensor that's a 3 by 3 but it only has non-zero quantities on the diagonal so that's that's typically how we would handle that i want to define this thermal strain uh, a little bit more formally now and say that anytime we have a strain that uh, does not contribute to stress, so I think hopefully you agree if I if I take a bar of steel and, and I uh, cool it down or heat it up so that it expands or contracts, it changes the, the length, so there is a strain, but I haven't I haven't created a stress in the material, at least not not macroscopically. Um, so in the that's an, and of course in the absence of any applied boundary conditions. So let me define uh, a new term for you. So let me just say that uh, strains that don't give rise to stress in the absence of applied boundary conditions and that remain after the removal of any load are called eigenstrains. So there's a few classes of these. So obviously strain due to thermal expansion fits this. Another source of eigenstrain is actually damage or cracking, right? If we have a cracked material or a damaged material and we unload it, there's sometimes still strains associated with that even though there aren't any stresses. And finally, the one that's important for us is plastic strains. So that's how plasticity is linked in and why we care about that. So, okay, so for the purposes of this class, we're gonna define um, uh, any strain due to plasticity as an eigenstrain, okay? So we can write uh, for the small strain case that the strain is just the sum of the elastic component, epsilon sub e, plus the plastic component. Uh, so this is what we would call the plastic strain, okay? And this elastic component is what controls the stress via Hooke's law. The plastic strain um, it evolves with the total strain. It's affected by the stress, but it remains after the removal of uh, any loads and does not contribute to the stress, at least in a macroscopic case. It might be a little easier to see this with a, with a graphic, and it's hopefully one you've seen before. If I were just to draw the stress-strain curve, for a material that has some plasticity, so there's strain and there's stress. Typically, we have an initial linear elastic load up, then yielding happens, plastic deformation takes place, and when we unload, it comes back down like that. And so, upon zero stress state macroscopically, we're left with this plastic strain epsilon P. A couple other things to note. So this is our load up and then our unloading curve. A couple things to note and something that we're gonna de we're gonna at least require for the plasticity that we're gonna talk about is that the modulus, the initial modulus of loading, which is just the Young's modulus, and the modulus of unloading are gonna be the same, namely the Young's modulus. So let's define that and say that in addition to being an eigenstrain, uh, we're going to require that plastic deformation not alter the Young's modulus E. And what that means effectively is that unloading occurs on the same slope 
as the initial loading. Okay, so that in tensor form, uh, we can write the following. That sigma ij is going to be equal to c i j k l, which we know what that looks like in the case of isotropic linear elasticity. And it's going to look like epsilon k l, that should be an l, k l. And I'm going to put the e as a superscript because I need the subscripts for my index values, minus epsilon k l p, which is our plastic strain. And of course, this is ignoring thermal strains. Okay, hopefully that makes sense. Um, the focus of this next uh, couple or several weeks of class when we talk about plasticity is going to be to to determine what this quantity is. What is the plastic strain um, and how does it evolve as we apply a load? So our focus will be on determining this quantity. Okay, so I hope I know that was uh, not terribly mathematically difficult, but I wanted to see, wanted you to see how what we've done before with all with respect to all of our linear elastic mechanics relates to what we're about to do with respect to plasticity. And, and essentially it's all grouped into how does that plastic strain evolve that we would then plug into this, this um, simple equation here that then we would be um, coupled with the other, the, the two equations we talked about at the beginning of the lecture.